glad that we can be here uh, to acknowledge another incredible part of that administration. And I think why I want to be here, not just because I'm a direct beneficiary of the teachings of Mitch Costanza, but because I and many of us are the beneficiaries of what she was willing to do for all of us. Uh, you're going to hear from Doreen in a moment about this title of a feminist in the White House. And Midge was history making in that role. You know, women were not given those opportunities. When President Carter gave Midge Costanza, I would say Midge probably knocked down a door to get that job. But however she got there, she was there. And you recognize the historical role it was for her to be there. But what I think is so extraordinary about Midge was she was not content to just be in that room and at that table, but that she invited others who had been marginalized for so long to be in that room and to join her at that table. And most specifically, and probably importantly to myself, uh, is the fact that the first meeting of LGBTQ activists was held in the White House in 1977 because Midge Costanza made that happen. That was a seed that was planted that has grown to where we are today. And I will thank her every day of my life for creating that opportunity. A meeting in the White House sounds important, but maybe not transformational. But when you read Doreen's book and you understand what happened from that multi-hour long meeting and the conversations and the issues that were never discussed before, that were discussed that day, and it certainly resulted in changes at department levels through the administrative uh, powers of the Carter administration, you recognize how the start of a movement of people who felt marginalized, excluded, and ignored finally started to change. Thank you all very much for being here. And her time in the White House was really about how to have integrity, how to do what she believed Carter had asked her to do, uh, in an administration that maybe didn't share her enthusiasm for LGBTQ issues, for women's rights, for the marginalized and oppressed, and how to do it with dignity and, and putting her values ahead of her career. And anybody who's experienced tokenism or other forms of discrimination knows that that is much harder than it sounds. That is much harder than it sounds. And so her story, while well, she left before the, uh, she left in, in 1978, um, her time in the White House, for me, the longer, the more time I spent with it, became a, um, a lesson in what it means to stand up for what you believe in when it comes at great personal cost. Um, and she did accomplish a lot, and mostly she accomplished remaining herself, remaining true to her values, um, even when it meant leaving the White House and coming out to California to start another chapter. So um, I would have called the book, like I said, an unwilling token because she refused it. Uh, she refused it which I've come the longer that I've been on this planet to admire more and more, as well as her other accomplishments. I, I don't want us to forget that. Regarding the book and Doreen, the book, uh, Professor Mattingly, Women's Studies, San Diego State, the book is phenomenal, has a great, great one-liners in there. It's warts and all. Uh, it's not one of these flowery books where you know, everything's wonderful. You know, Mitch had a lot of battles and uh, fought them all with grace and dignity and temerity and tenacity, as everyone here knows. Here's Midge, no formal college, edu no college education. This book gets published by Oxford Uni University Press. How the heck did you pull that off? I don't know, but uh, it just says uh, a lot about Midge and who she was. Now I want to thank some of the major donors. They're here today. One who couldn't be here, I'll, ha I'll have to name first and foremost, is uh, Erwin Jacobs. When I first contacted him, I just got the words out. It, you know, Piazza Costanza were thinking, how can I help? Didn't, no questions asked, not, not how big, how much, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so thank you, Erwin Jacobs. Midge again, off and running on her own. You know the expression, it's better to ask for permission, and it's been not to ask for permission, but to ask for forgiveness, and that was Midge's mantra. Her ideas were always good, and she was an invaluable resource, obviously, so, knew so many people in the community. But she was mischievous, she was playful, she had a twinkle in her eye, an infectious laugh, that no matter what she did, you just had to say, well, that was, that was Midge. One of Bonnie's sweetest memories of Midge is when she gathered everybody in the office to uh, the big screen TV on the, on the day of Obama's um, inauguration, and with tears in everyone's eyes, they witnessed history. 
Midge never thought she'd live long enough to see that, and it was a very powerful time for her. So Midge was a large part of my family. Um, she was with us for the majority of holidays, all the birthdays. Um, she didn't have a family here, so she adopted our family and Lori Black's family and a few others. But she was just a she was just a joy to to have as a personal friend. She was so excited. She was excited about everything. And it was exciting to be with her as a friend. She was a lot of fun. She had a soft side. Not many people saw it. She was very, very, as a friend, she was very loyal. Loyal, fiercely loyal. She would do anything anybody asked of her. Any favor, speak anywhere, she would do it. She would make time. She was very generous with her time. She would speak at our fundraisers. She'd speak in the classrooms of our children. She'd write recommendation letters for us and for our kids. She wrote speeches for many of the people I see here because I found them in her desk. <laughs> She'd bring in nationally, nationally known speakers for our fundraisers, and it was very exciting to meet all these people that had really never been to San Diego. She remembered so many of us on our birthdays. That was one of her things. She would call people on their birthdays and she would disguise her voice as if we didn't know who it was. She had 86 names and phone numbers on her calendar um, that we had after she passed away who, that she would call on their birthdays. As we started after COVID, we said, how are we gonna raise the money for this? We raised about $190,000 in this. We've never raised money so fast. And the reason why is because Midge was so popular. And we want to thank Tony Atkins, who couldn't be here today, large contribution. Tara Lawson Reamer, our, our supervisor, who also could not be here, but her chief of staff, Megan, is here, half Italian American, of course. And um, we, all the other people, Manpower, that contributed, Mal and Phil, great contributor. Erwin Jacobs, who was very close with Midge, contributed. We raised all this money because people just wanted to support this whole idea of a tribute to Mitch Costanza. So I'd like to conclude by saying, we know that the world is a really troubled place right now. We know that. There are things that we need to do to make sure that we make it a little bit easier for people to survive and have faith and optimism in the future. Things like this give us optimism and faith in the future. This is going to be a piazza for everybody in San Diego. You don't have to live in Little Italy, own property, be a business, be an employee. This is for anybody to come out, just enjoy it, with the tables and chairs and umbrellas will be here. These trees will turn beautiful fall color in a few months, and then it will also be a great canopy in the summer and give you shade. It's one of the most intimate piazzas that we've built, and everybody who's been contributing to this, I just want to thank them to the bottom of my heart.